He was brave. He was sensational. Wow. Everything would change from cowboys and Indians in about five seconds. He was so cool and calm under fire. He was so in himself. He was bitter. He was vengeful. Turn your face to hide your identity. He was dull. Your evil can never win. He was humorless. Oh, I'll kill you. But he could fight like buggery. There was always a certain element of magic involved in what they were doing. Very much saturated in the culture of the Western. And we'd never seen an Eastern. Nineteen sixty four Australia, a country on the brink. In less than nineteen years since the end of World War Two, they built the good life. Those dark days with the Japanese at the door are now a distant memory. But this cosy world is about to change forever. Three days after Christmas, commercial TV station Channel 9 screened the first episode of a show that would rock the country. For the kids of Australia, the TV series The Samurai became an obsession. Aussie kids fell into a new fantasy world. You! I am not Saranobu. My name is Shintaro. Why, you? You tricked me. Where's Saranobu? You Koga ninja. You're all fools. This man must die. <laughs> to the astonishment of their parents, they became Japanese. They were samurai and something called ninjas, shouting his name across the backyards of Australia. The samurai was loosely based on historical events, taking place during the late 1700s. The story goes like this. Akikusa Shintaro, our hero, was hired by the Premier to protect the young shogun from the evil warlords. His adventures lead him to befriend an eager ninja by the name of Tombei the Mist <laughs> and an orphan boy named Shusaku. Together, they embarked on protecting the government from the endless supply of evil assassins known as the ninjas. Take off your mask! <laughs> Shinsaro Akiksa. I don't know about the others, but you cannot fool this master ninja's eyes. Wait! <laughs> but that's not why the samurai and Shintaro swept the country and made some older Australians ask, who really won the war anyway? You got to see something which was just totally unusual, which was totally, totally, totally out of the norm that you would see on television. I told you, there were no effects in the samurai. They were all absolutely real. Not that I would have thought it was a special effect, like the thing of the jumping out of trees. For some reason, it never bothered anyone that most of the stunts shown in the series were physically impossible, like walking on water. We'll meet again. <laughs> the stuff that they could do with ropes and hooks, it was just a whole extraordinary, marvellous, surprising world. My grandmother had a broomstick which he used to attach broom heads to. And I used to stick the broomstick in the back and I just loved pulling out a sword from behind. So I was, also loved Zorro. This was a bit pansy. This was But as kids, we just thought was absolutely fabulous and the sensational 30 foot jump upward or back out of the trees. It was just a marvelous thing. And so suddenly that took over our world of fantasy. But apart from the whole new world of samurai and ninjas, the thing that has stuck to this day in the memories of the children of that generation was the shurikens, commonly known as those bloody star knives. For some reason, it was just really satisfying going... I mean, it was just sort of nuts. You'd only have one star knife, but then you'd keep throwing them afterwards. 
sticking in the wood and they never hit him. He was always deflecting them and stuff and how he could see them coming at him was always amazing. <laughs> I remember eating my wagon wheels in the shape of a star so that I could hold it in my hand. I didn't do metal work at the time, but I did go home and use my mother's dressmaking scissors to cut out tin can lids to make, to make the throwing stars. And not that they worked very well. Uh, it was a curious thing about the samurai that Shintaro, or Shintaro Akikusa, only had to stand beside a tree and suddenly it was alive with bloody star knives. They had no trouble at all hitting trees. They just couldn't hit people. Ninjas are stupid. <laughs> That's right. We got the samurai spirit as, as 11 year old children. Suddenly, he was Shintaro and a Japanese hero that we gladly, thrillingly embraced. No one had expected it, but Japanese TV was invading Australia. And it would bring more than star knives and fancy swordplay. Every week with her, hard riding, great shooting. Hey, what's the matter? Luke Johnson and Cash Naylor. If somebody don't stop them, they're going to kill each other. The yeah, they're wrecking the place. No. In the world before Shintaro and the Samurai, kids TV was okay, but it was pretty predictable. And while the kids were happy to watch, they were also up for something new. Come on, boy. You know you're done. I'll kill you now, Shintaro. The Samurai was always going to look exotic compared to the comfortable world of Aussie suburbia. <laughs> Did you see that? I'm sorry. What? But it wasn't what just the swordplay and the ninja stars that made everyone sit up and take notice. Gentaro, I really hate to kill a man with your intelligence. The samurais, the lone gunman or swordsman, wandering the countryside, fighting off bad guys, saving the girl or saving the good people. You know, that Clint Eastwood analogy is very close. I've lost this fight, Shintaro. The amazing thing about the samurai obsession was the villains were as popular as the Shining Knight, Shintaro. And it was the only show I've ever seen where the kids wanted to be the ninjas, not Shintaro. They wanted to jump around, wear black pajamas, and, and, and get killed. The Puma Ninja Spider Attack! Get him! The Spider Ninja were probably the guys that really made me sit up and go, wow, that's pretty weird. <laughs> they hung up in trees on rope spider webs, waiting to drop down on uh, unsuspecting samurai. <laughs> I remember the puppet ninjas. That was very interesting. They were disguised as a band of traveling puppeteers. And uh, Shintaro couldn't see through that, the idiot. The other thing about those ninjas was, what you saw wasn't necessarily what you got. One of the great disguises that the ninjas would use would be as an old man carrying sticks. So you'd have this hunched old bloke with this rack full of sticks on his back, and uh, Shintaro would go, oh, no, where are you going now? Who are you? And he would just say, I'm just an old man carrying sticks. And as soon as he got sticks out, he'd try and cut Shintaro's head off. He was a bad bastard. What is it, old man? Eh, I was stupid. I dropped my flint and stone somewhere, and I very much would like to smoke my pipe right now, uh, if I could. <laughs> I didn't know who the bad guys were. Oh, yes. You could have told me that, the, that, that Shintaro was the bad guy, and I would have believed it. I, I didn't quite know what was going on. Shintaro, do you think that old man is a Nagishi ninja? No, even a very well-trained ninja would show evil intentions on his face. No, I don't think that he was a ninja in disguise. But if that old man was a ninja... If he was? Then he would be one of their most skillful ones. Originally made only for Japanese television, the samurai was naturally filmed in Japanese. But the producers were thinking big. They dreamed of reaching out to the lucrative English-speaking market. 
Japanese animation like Astro Boy had recently made a killing in the US, and maybe the samurai could do the same thing, which meant the series had to be dubbed into English. Here is the real murder weapon that I hold in my hand. Isn't whatsoever. But the Aussie public had a few surprises up its sleeve. 1965 was still a very white Australia, but Shintaro and his ninjas had more friends than many thought. However, then there was an interesting groundswell, and a lot of letters from people who had obviously been watching it with the children wrote explaining the context of the show, the whole idea of the Japanese mythology, of the noble art of the samurai, of the task that they took on, of the sacrifice in ways akin to uh, the Christian crusaders. And a lot of spirited argument went back and forth. Mr. Morgan uh, should return to school and learn a little more about it. Who is your place? But it was all lost on the kids. They reckoned they knew what Shintaro was about. The message of the show was actually quite simple. There were the good guys and the bad guys. There was a little bit of fuzziness involved there, because as I recall, he would always rescue uh, the innocent and, and, and protect the weak. These were all positive messages. OK. Oh, he wasn't a vigilante. He was, in fact, supposedly a, a secret agent. And in fact, of course, when you look at him that way, that ties into the secret agent genre that was also starting to become popular in the mid-60s. But what about all that senseless Japanese violence? Well, firstly, I object to the term senseless violence. I find all of it completely sensible. He did have a strong moral code. He was out for vengeance and he went about his way and he never started a fight. He always, he's like an AFL footballer in that regard. He never started one. Shintaro, now you will die. This was exactly the same code of honour with the Shintaro, that he was not one who would just reach for his sword at the first sign of trouble. It was always to save the day at the end of trying other alternative means. I didn't want to fight in the hotel. As a child, it never seemed as violent as shooting somebody like a cowboy did, or, or an Indian with an arrow, which is what we'd see. It didn't seem as violent as that to me. But the good stuff was the hardware. No self-respecting samurai or ninja could be without his sword. There were plastic shuriken and plastic swords and the ninja suits, but we couldn't afford them anyway because we didn't have very much money. And the only one I would have liked were the plastic swords. They had a colour photograph of some of the characters in, which were not on the gum set, so they would have been quite good. Although there were some things you just couldn't get. Of course, I wanted blinding dust. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I wanted blinding dust. Take this! The Eager Ninja blinding trick! Get him! For the avid collector, there were the special samurai cards, the passport to a not-so-secret society. As a result of the samurai, we had bubblegum cards. They cost uh, sixpence a, a pack, and I think you got three cards per pack. The cards themselves were interesting. They had scenes from the program, but on the back, you put together a great big uh, shot of Shintaro. So the cards were very exciting. That was something we could carry in our pocket and be very, very proud of. We could have a set of cards. And so we had everybody in the program in our hands. We could sleep with this under our pillow and dream at night. It was... 1965 had been a big year. Australia had gone from its slightly sleepy, self-contained self to being obsessed with samurais and ninjas. But just watching the samurai on TV wasn't enough. Christmas Day 1965, just three days short of a year since the first episode of The Samurai went to air. Shintaro, or at least the actor that played him, Koichi Ose, landed at Sydney Airport. The result was pandemonium. At last, Australian kids could get their hands on Shintaro. 
My main recollection of it, frankly, is screaming fans and particularly screaming teenagers um, practically pushing the poor man over. But he's a, a, a very well-respected actor in Japan and was at the time as well, which I think is why he was attracted to this series, because it was a highly artful, respectful series. Anyway, he's, the, the poor bastard's come to Australia and he's got six-year-olds kicking the shit out of him because they want to get to him. The poor guy doesn't know what's going on. Ose had been brought out by the sweets and candy makers who were the force behind much of the merchandising. When you think about it, I can't think of any other character that, that uh, a gum manufacturer and card manufacturer bought out like that or had a big part of a show there. I mean, certainly not. They had Starsky and Hutch and yeah, they had all these other shows that were huge, you know, uh, even movie cards, the monkeys, etc. They never supported them like they supported Shintaro. There was a real mystique about him, I think, that, that, uh, that Australia had never seen before, Australian kids had never seen before. Kids couldn't believe that this was the man who could do all of this and here he was would blow your mind. You're watching this feudal Japan thing on, on television and here he is in the full gear. Amazing. But I was unaware that there had been an actual visit of Shintaro and the, and the, 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 the ninja to Australia until I discovered something one day which told me what had actually happened. And having seen what I discovered, I don't know how on earth I missed the fact that it had been on in the first place. It must have been the Women's Weekly it had a photo spread, I think, and uh, I got wind of it being a bit of a... But <clears throat> I think I thought those who would have gone to see him were dicks. <laughs> but most kids couldn't wait. Anticipation among fans was intense. Performances played for six days, attracting 6,000 ninja clad kids each time. All up, more people than saw the Beatles. My dear old Uncle Jack has since been gathered but uh, took me to see the live uh, samurai show at the Sydney Stadium which isn't there anymore uh, it was a wood and tin structure that they had fights in and Christmas in Sydney at the Sydney Stadium you couldn't have got a hotter place to hold it I'm there in my full ninja outfit right with the head thing on the whole deal with my sword I'm going to see Shintaro my Uncle Jack said that, you know, it was like a sea of ants because there were all these kids dressed as ninjas and uh, there you are on the wooden seats. They were the real bleachers there at Sydney Stadium and it was the world's unbelievably hottest day. I was also a kid with a little bit of asthma, so <laughs> you can imagine all these bad things coming together. I had that hood on and everything like that and out comes the samurai. For young boys at that age, it was just as good as the Beatles. It was like, wow, the samurai, this is fantastic. I was dressed up. I think I had an old dressing gown on of some variety to resemble a kimono or whatever. Um, and I had my trusty uh, two sticks down my belt and my star knives. I was dumbfounded at the show. I was just in shock. There were ninjas running everywhere, coming down on ropes and, and flash bombs going off and God knows what. And then Shintaro would appear at a beautiful white light there, shining like a god. I was completely shocked. It was the first show I ever saw. <laughs> um, and uh, it was fabulous. It was so fabulous, the tour was expanded to Melbourne. When the news got out, 7,000 excited fans swamped Essendon Airport. I went to Essendon Airport to see the Beatles arrive in 1964, and there were people lining the streets of Essendon watching them go past. And to have heard later on that there were more people to greet Shintaro at uh, the airport in 1965 than there were for the Beatles, 
was just an incredible thing to hear. I think he drew a bigger crowd than Judy Garland, who was also on at uh, Festival Hall around about that time. Very much a pop star. There were screaming girls at the, at the Festival Hall gig. Newspapers were now suggesting Ose was hot in more ways than one. After a whirlwind 15-day tour and 12 live shows, a stunned Koichi Ose returned to Japan, astonished by his reception. Back in Australia, rival network Channel 7 was looking for a samurai of its own. Chitaro, Koga Ninja, what are you trying to do? It was only the samurai with Shintaro and his ninjas that really clicked. Even now, more than three decades later, it still connects with its old audience. Gary was part of a samurai season that toured the country showing old episodes. This was from one of the shows that we did uh, at the Valhalla Cinema. Every, every show we did was a sellout smash success. Wonderfully done. I knew that there was a large fan base out there of my age group, the baby boomer age group, that would definitely be interested in um, revisiting the samurai. And they all came out of the woodwork when uh, it was announced that we were putting it out. And the initial sales were most encouraging on every one of the series that I put out, all six series. So there was definitely a base of somewhere around a thousand people who would automatically buy uh, each of the box sets that were released. You couldn't have fitted a, a cigarette paper between the people in the cinema. It was absolutely packed. They were hanging from the rafters. There were people my age who had seen it when they were little kids at school. Their sons, their sons' sons, their sons' sons' sons. There were generations of people. It was the most incredible afternoon. The samurai feeling of all the people in that cinema. There was a golden halo right around the whole cinema of samurai memory. It was incredible. There's a sushi restaurant in Parramatta Road, Annandale, that I went to quite frequently. Wonderful sushi. There is a photo uh, of Shintaro autographed to the owner of the bar. There's an interesting thing with anyone who's been a fan of the samurai. You have this brotherhood thing. So immediately he and I got along like a house on fire. I went, you've got the photo of Shintaro. He's gone, yes, I saw him here. I saw, I saw, I saw him at Sydney Stadium. Oh, my God. <laughs> All good things come to an end. In the last episode, Tombe wakes to find a letter. Shintaro was gone. The Samurai played for 10 series on Australian and Japanese television. It lasted till the late 70s. But by then, a new generation wanted something different. It was more than just a children's television show. It was written at various levels. The obviously in trans lots of adults who could see you know greater themes going on behind the obvious it was the complete introduction of a completely different culture to people who'd never seen anything like it before we were all looking for something a little bit different not necessarily another group of long-haired blokes playing guitars to annoy our parents totally different from what we knew, which had been all sort of European and American influence. It was a mixture of ancient and the Wild West. The medieval romance, the epic storytelling that I really liked. It was very, you know, Lord of the Rings in its sort of scale and the scope of the storytelling. It was a turning point in Australian history, social history, and I don't think that's an overstatement. It actually opened up a different world to you, which is a legitimate culture, which hopefully one day I'll find out more about. So in that sense, I think it was a wonderful thing. It really was. It was certainly better than Macau's Navy in that respect. Uh, 
隠密研修をご覧になっていただきましたオーストラリアのファンの皆さんえこんな年を取った秋草慎太郎ですが今後どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。Shintaro, thank you. Arigato gozaimasu for giving me such a wonderful childhood. Dude, you rocked. What a wonderful man and what a wonderful series. You were real in my life as a nine year old boy. I thought you were great. The messages and principles that you taught me, I've carried on for the rest of my life. And may your sword stay sharp, my friend. Hats off.